And we're going to talk about gravity. You've learned how to do free body diagrams, but you haven't learned about all the different types of forces. We've just been telling you the forces. Well, now you're going to learn almost every day a new force. Today you learn about gravity, and we'll complete that on Monday. Then Tuesday you'll learn about friction, or no, normal force. Then Wednesday you'll learn about friction, and then Thursday you'll learn about tension. And so every day brings a new force. But it doesn't going to change what you do. What you're doing is still putting forces on your free body diagram. You're still doing the sum of the forces equals ma. It's just you're learning about a new force every day. And then later on this semester, you'll learn about electrical force. You'll learn about magnetic force. You'll learn about buoyant force. But they're all just new vectors to put in the same old free body diagrams. Well, today is day one. Today you learn about gravity. Yay. So let me tell you about Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was trying to figure out why, why does the moon orbit the earth? Now, at his time, people explained motion by natural motion and violent motion. This idea of violent motion is motion you impose on something by exerting a force, and natural motion comes about when there's no longer a force acting on an object. And at the time of Isaac Newton, they still believed, as Aristotle believed, that when no force acts on an object, the object will eventually come to rest. All you have to do is look around a room. Everything in the room is at rest. Why? Because that's a natural state of things, is to be at rest. But heavenly bodies followed totally different laws. Heavenly bodies had their own sets of natural motion. And the biggest natural motion of heavenly bodies is they tend to go in circles. The moon circles the earth. The earth circles the sun. Heavenly bodies move in circles. If I took a rock and somehow could put it in the heavens, now that rock would naturally move in a circle. Why? Because heavenly objects move in circles. That's their natural state of motion. Okay? Well, Isaac Newton was already kind of getting rid of this type of thinking when he adopted Galileo's thinking of that the natural motion of things is actually to remain in straight line, constant velocity motion, or at rest, unless a force acts on it. So now he's trying to figure out, okay, so why does the moon orbit the earth? And it's not because heavenly things all move in circles. There has to be some real reason for why the moon is orbiting the earth. And then he looked up and he was sitting under a tree, sitting under an apple tree. And he looked at this apple on a low branch. And he thought, well, you know what? If that apple were to fall off that branch, it would fall to the ground. If it were you know, released, it would fall to the ground because of gravity. Then he looked at the top branch of the apple tree and he thought, well, you know, even an apple that high, if it was released from the branch, would fall to the ground. Then he looked through the... <laughs> then he, then he looked, and that's going to be on YouTube. Then he, then he looked through, the, then he looked through the branches of the tree to see the moon, and he thought, well, what if this tree were as tall as the moon? Would that apple still fall to earth? And he's going, sure, why not? I mean, there's not going to be some point. If I've got an apple tree that's rooted on the earth, there's not going to be some point where the apple tree gets too tall where now the object isn't going to fall to earth. So at that point, he figures, okay, that moon is like the top of an apple tree. That moon is being pulled to the earth. And that's why the moon is orbiting the earth, because of gravity. And so from this, he realized that what governs the motion of, of everything in the heavens is gravity. And so you get Newton's law of universal gravitation. Newton's law of universal gravitation. <clears throat> And what it says simply with this, everything in the universe attracts everything else in the universe. That's it. Everything in the universe attracts everything else in the universe. Gravitation is universal. 
Now, of course, we know now that really when I say everything in the universe, I mean everything in the universe with mass. Everything with mass attracts everything else. But back then, they didn't know about you know this idea of energy and stuff. They just thought there's a bunch of stuff, and all this stuff attracts everything else. Let me give you this question. Let's say our class, all of us, you guys seated in your desks and me standing up here, what if we transported all of us into deep space? So now we're all configured just like this, but there's no planets or stars nearby. And of course we have big fish bowls on our head, like, like uh, what's your name, Sandy in, in SpongeBob has to have to survive underwater. So we've got these things on our head to, to make sure that we you know, can still breathe. And so now we're all floating in space. Well, given enough time, what are we going to do? We're going to gravitate towards each other. We're going to come together. We're going to clump together. And that's the way planets and stars are formed. Stars start out as just a bunch of gas, a bunch of dust. And the dust comes together to form a star, right? That's why we have galaxies and solar systems, because matter agglomerates. If it wasn't for gravitation, our universe would consist of a uniformly distributed fine mist of, of particles. We wouldn't have anything in the universe. It would just be dust, you know? But thank God we have gravitation, and so matter agglomerates, and we get to have you know, galaxies and things like that. Matter agglomerates One thing I used to say is that every single person in this class, without exception, is physically attracted to every other person in this class. <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing. Don't fight it. It's beautiful. <laughs> so, because of what Newton discovered about gravitation, we get something called the Newtonian synthesis, which I actually had never heard of until about 15 years ago when I saw uh, Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe. It's nothing I was ever taught. But I think the Newtonian synthesis is really cool. And the Newtonian synthesis says that the same physical laws that govern motion on Earth also govern motion in the heavens. There's not two separate and distinct sets of laws, one for the heavens and one for the Earth. No way. We all follow the same physical laws. <laughs> He synthesized the physics of the heavens and the earth. Heavens and earthly things all follow the same laws. Yeah. And so now Isaac Newton sat down to try to mathematically describe gravity. And the way he was going to do it was to take what he knew of Johannes Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, which we'll learn about when we learn about circular motion. So we're going to deal with his three laws of planetary motion in chapter 8. But just believe me now when I say Isaac Newton took Kepler's three laws of planetary motion and did math on them. Then he took what he knew about the moon and the earth and he discovered the following things. He's discovered the gravitational, gravitational force, which I'm going to call F sub G. The first thing he found is not equal. He found that gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses that are exerting gravitational force on each other. It's proportional to m1 times m2. So let's say I had two masses, m1 and m2, and they're a certain distance apart. And it turns out that the gravitational force that these two masses exert on each other is f. What if I were to double one of the masses 
so that this mass is now twice as big, but this mass has stayed the same. What have I just done to the gravitational force? You guys thinking we doubled it? That's what we did. We doubled it. The gravitational force is now twice what the force was originally. By the way, can I ask you this question? Does this mass exert more gravitational force on this mass because he's bigger than this mass exerts on that one? No. What, what can you tell me about the gravitational force that this guy exerts on this guy versus the gravitational force that this guy exerts on that guy? What's that, Alfred? What's that? It's stronger. This force is stronger than that? Okay. So it's like this guy is pulling on this guy with this big force, but this guy is pulling on this guy with this teeny tiny force? Okay. How many people think that's true? Okay. Is there an alternative? <coughs> what, what can you tell me about the force? And does it matter that it's action at a distance? Or could you also picture it as just being a tug of war where they're tugging on each other with a big rope? What can you tell me about the force that this guy exerts on that guy versus the force that this guy exerts on that guy? Yes? Why? Why would you say something crazy like that? Why would they be the same? Thank you. Equal and opposite. Which of Newton's laws assure us that they have to be the same? Which law? Third law, yeah. <laughs> Newton's third law. So I want you to see, it's kind of like what's happening is this, this planet exerts more, lots of force on this planet because he's so big, but this planet exerts a lot of force on this planet, not because he's big, but because he's big. You see what I mean? So, so it's like it's the same thing. So yeah, they exert the same force just in opposite directions. Sure. And let me ask you this. What if I doubled this mass and I also doubled this mass? Now, what would the gravitational force be between these two planets compared to what it was before I doubled the two masses? Four times. Yeah, four times as big, right? Because you double this guy's mass, so he'll exert twice as much fast. And you double this guy's mass, so he's got twice as much mass to be attracted to. You know, it's kind of like if you took a man and a woman and made both of them twice as attractive, then that'd be just sparks would fly. <laughs> where, where if only one of them is twice as attractive, well, you know, that's good. I mean, this guy would be really attracted to her, but maybe I don't know. I guess that's the analogy starting to break down. But, but you guys, you guys get it. Okay, great. Here's the second thing Isaac Newton discovered, and you tell me. When these masses get farther away from each other, what happens to the gravitational force they exert on each other? Is it going to go up or go down? You have a sense that it's going to go down, right? The farther away from each other, the less attraction they're going to have for each other, right? Sure. That's why cross-country romances never work. And so he discovered this. And again, he used Kepler's laws of universal gra uh, Kepler's planetary laws, of, or the laws of planetary motion, and he found that gravitational force is inversely proportional. I have to have it be inversely proportional because the bigger R is, the smaller the gravitational force has to be. He found that it's inversely proportional to the square of the distances between the objects. Let me give you a bunch of examples to demonstrate what this actually means. Yes, Sean. What's that? Oh, R is distance. So some books use D for distance, but our book and many other texts use R for distance. I don't know why. For like radius or something? Okay, so let's say I have two masses and there's some distance R apart. And I told you the gravitational force between them is F. I'm now going to double the distance between these two masses. The distance between them has now been doubled. Well, first of all, like you guys said, the, the new force is going to be less. My question to you is, how much less? I've doubled the distance. Is the new force going to be half as big as the old force was because I doubled the distance? What do you guys say? What say it, Chris? Why'd you say one fourth? It's only twice as far away. 
have to square the distance. Oh, you got to square the distance. It'd be like my force, 1 over I doubled r, but you're squaring that to r to give you 1 over <laughs> 4 r squared, or 1 fourth times 1 over r squared. Yeah, it'd be 1 fourth as much. So this new force would be 1 fourth f. Let me give you another, two more, and then we'll leave this. Tell me, what if I tripled the distance between these two objects? Now, compared to this situation, how much is the force? And I'll give you a, two choices. It's either one-third as much or one-ninth as much. How many people vote that the force between these two masses is now one-third what it was originally? Nobody. I just want to tell this. Cameron, nobody. How many people say one-ninth? Woo! Yay. Cool. And here, let me do one more. What if I cut the distance in half? The distance has been cut in half now. Well, definitely the force is going to be stronger because they're closer. The question is, how much stronger? Yeah. Well, you guys tell me. Four times. How many people say, how many people agree with Noel it's four? Yay. That's it. That's inverse square law. And many things in our universe follow inverse square law. It's not just gravitational force between two objects, but it's the electrical force between two objects follows the inverse square law. Um, another example of inverse square law is sound. If I'm at some loud concert and I'm near a speaker, then if I double my distance away from the speaker, then I divide the intensity of the sound by four, you know, because sound follows inverse square law. You know, I don't think, I don't think smell follows inverse square law. There was one time I was standing in line at a Stater Brothers and the, the guy in front of me, he was a homeless guy and he smelled really, really bad. And he was buying two things, a big jug of alcohol and a half gallon of pineapple juice. That's all he was <laughs> buying. So I guess he was an alcoholic homeless guy. Yeah. But, uh, but I had to get away from him because he smelled so bad. But I think it was, I think it was like inverse fifth power or something. Because <laughs> all I had to do was take one step back and I didn't smell him anymore. So it just, I just thought that would be really interesting to tell you. Would that be diffusion? <laughs> diffusion, yeah. It would be diffusion, the rate of diffusion. Yeah, so that's a much more complicated mathematical <laughs> thing than, than this sort of stuff. Yeah, rate of diffusion. That's why we messed with the universe. <laughs> What's that? Mass one or mass two is equal to the inverse square root of the rate. Oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Okay, well, hey, hey, I got to do more stuff with you guys. So, so Isaac Newton, he, he discovered this stuff, and so he says, you know what? I think gravitation follows this formula. Gravitational force equals some constant g times the product of the masses over the square of the distance. And this is the formula he discovered, the law of universal gravitation formula. The law of universal gravitation formula. Okay. The problem is, when he checked his data against the current measurements of the moon and the distance between the Earth and the moon and the mass of the Earth and all, his formula didn't work. And so he set it aside, I think it was like seven years or nine years, until new numbers that were, uh, you know, giving the size and the mass of the Earth and the distance to the moon and the mass of the moon came out. And then he plugged it into his formula, and then his formula worked. So it took a while, but then he was able to publish. Here's the weird thing, though. Isaac Newton had no way of finding what G was, and I'll talk about that later. All he could say was that gravitational force is proportional to m1 times m2 and inversely proportional to r squared, but I don't know what that proportionality constant is. And it fell to another man, a guy named Henry Cavendish, to discover what the value of g is. So for like a century, you know, we're able to use this formula, except we don't know what g is. So all we can talk about is proportionality. Let me write down what all those things actually mean. f sub g equals the gravitational force. M1 and M2 equals masses of objects 
number one and number two. I do want to remind you it takes two to tango. You need two objects to make a force. You can't have gravitational force without two objects. Uh, R is the distance between, and here's something I haven't mentioned yet. R is the distance between the centers of mass. Do you notice how I kind of drew my arrow to go to the middle of these guys? That's because R is always measured to the center of mass of the objects. Distance between centers <coughs> of mass of the objects. And then finally, capital G is the universal gravitational constant. Let's see if I can find a pen that has more in And that has a value of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton kilogram squared per meter Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Six point six seven times ten to the negative eleventh. Can I have you guys do a problem? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have two one kilogram masses, and I'm holding them one meter apart. How much gravitational force are they exerting on each other? Please figure that out now. Two one kilogram masses situated one meter apart. How much gravitational force are they exerting on each other? the universal gravitational constant has the crazy units that it has. It needs to have meters squared here because it cancels those meters squared, and it needs to have kilogram squareds here to cancel those kilogram squareds. And so I'm just left with the newtons. And did you guys get 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons? Yes. Uh, okay, good. So approximately, you know, a trillionth of a newton. So tell me, am I having a lot of difficulty holding these two masses apart? No, not at all. In fact, the, the gravitational force they exert on each other is pretty much unmeasurable. I mean, with my, what I have around here in this classroom, I couldn't possibly measure the gravitational force they're exerting on each other because it's so teeny tiny. Yeah. But there you go, and that's a lucky thing. I mean, if gravitational force was really high, then we would sure be hugging each other a lot. Yeah, it'd be a, again, it would be a beautiful thing. All right. Well, hey, you guys. At this point, I was going to go on and talk about gravity at Earth's surface, but that's, this is where I left off in my other two classes. So I'm going to leave off here, and, and I'm going to do uh, a closure. Just remember, universal the law of universal gravitation, what does that say? Everything in the universe attracts, attracts everything else in the universe. Great. So what did Isaac Newton say? What's the inverse square law say? The inverse square law says force is inversely proportional to the distance squared. Yeah. OK. And then you got uh, the law of universal gravitation right there, the formula. OK, good luck, you guys.